make uh, some pretty significant uh, jumps. So it's all about keeping the, mem the momentum to, to keep the jumps moving. So if we do that, then we would move into a, uh, at least the number three uh, position. So the scenario exercise helps us. We have a diagnostic tool, we have a plan, we have the agencies, we need your help because these agencies also need advice on how to improve. You guys should go through the process, but in order, you know, when, when you're running, you have to understand in the agency, when they have been running a process for so long, um, they are um, in a way ruled by the law, ruled by the habit, ruled by regulations. It's difficult to make a change uh, with a person who's been doing something for 20 or 30 years. So we need outside eyes in there, you guys, to help us give advice on how do we make improvements. And we need to learn from private sector companies how they've uh, made improvements and, and streamlined in their own uh, businesses because we can learn those processes and try to adapt them into government uh, process. So this is the timetable. I won't go through it in detail. We started already. We've got uh, Game Plan 2.0 approved. Uh, we are moving, uh, we run video uh, conferences with IFC in Washington, we run validation workshops, we meet the private sector. There's a whole range of things that we do that you will see on, on the next succeeding slides until we submit and the report is released in October again. Now I just want to shift a little to what else we're doing, just, you know, this is not the only thing we're doing, we do a lot. So uh, I want to just illustrate quickly what else is being done. Uh, we have the Islands of Good Governance uh, project. Uh, this one is, uh, puts the uh, selected agencies and LGUs who volunteer to get on a balanced scorecard system with us. But the difference here is that this year, last year, this year, the last three years up to this year, everyone's moving on a self-disclosure uh, basis. By 2015, they will migrate to externally audited uh, uh, reports. So just imagine that if DPWH or DOTC or DepEd tells you they're doing something, it's not a matter of coming, them coming back to us and just giving an accomplishment report. They have agreed that they will, some of these agencies have agreed, they will be externally audited. So now you have an independent uh, assessment of whether they hit their targets or not. I think that's going to be that's going to make a huge change. And external auditing is not by COA, by the way. It's an operations audit. So it's by a private auditing uh, firm that we will uh, bring on board for this particular project. So th this is uh, uh, what it's like uh, right now. Um, we are also recruiting people to sit on the multi-sectoral governance council. So these are like the uh, uh, independent directors that we place as advisors to cabinet secretaries to help uh, in, in these agencies. So just an example, this would be the uh, DPWH uh, scorecard, and this is a public document, so you can see and track, and later on, uh, you can keep this data, and you can ask, I know Secretary Singh is your speaker later, you can ask him, and he can tell you in detail exactly how they're performing against this scorecard. It's a very transparent process. He has a multi-sectoral governance uh, board uh, with him, and uh, it's a very transparent process, as I say, and he'll be happy, I think, to, to explain where he is uh, above or below target on the, on the scorecard. We're also working to put together city uh, competitiveness indices because it's difficult to get data on, uh, on cities. Next slide, please. So uh, why do we want to get cities competitive? We can't run the country on, on two or three large urban centers. We need about 15 to 20. Uh, urban centers, and uh, we can't get the information, but we need to spread investment opportunities, spread development opportunity. Uh, that will, of course, have an impact on poverty reduction and on, uh, on building the, the middle class as well. So we've started this process of building uh, competitiveness indices for different cities. Uh, we, we started by creating regional competitiveness committees. We have 15 of them now. With the help of USAID and Project Invest, they put together a uh, basket of 30 indicators that created the, the first uh, index, jointly prepared with the regions. And then these regions collected data. After putting it together, they collected data in 285 uh, cities and municipalities. This year we will raise that number to 550 cities and municipalities to cover all cities and first class municipalities and then we'll be able to rank them. So a sample ranking that we have, you see the top 10 uh, for uh, uh, cities last year and the top 10 for municipalities. There are 285 in the list and as I said we'll up this number to 
to 550. And this way, as businessmen, you will know and be able to evaluate getting at least some basic information of uh, what the state of competitiveness of a city or municipality will be. Might help you in uh, making a locational decision for your offices or branches in the future. So what are the other projects? We have a lot of others. and. Uh, and this helps us improve, I believe, the state of, of competitiveness. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Annual Enterprise Survey on Corruption. Uh, this has been a, running for many years, and it's a good diagnostic tool for the government uh, to receive feedback from the private sector in an organized way, how each agency is doing, not only nationally, but in seven selected cities. So if you want to find out how, uh, say, Department of Trade is doing across seven cities, we can get that. If you want to find out for Department of Health or Department of Education or Department of Public Works uh, or Bureau of Customs or BIR or PNP, we can get that too because they're all rated uh, across uh, the cities plus get the national rating. Uh, we have customer satisfaction surveys. If ever you receive one from us, please answer it because it's the only way for us to give feedback on you know, how these local governments are doing. We always complain about LGUs. Let's give them the data and tell them how good or how bad they're doing, but let's do it in an organized fashion so we can actually help them improve their processes. Uh, we're opening up, a new, well, we have opened up a new working group on agricultural and trade logistics, but more importantly, we're gonna open up new working groups on manufacturing, national quality infrastructure, and services. So those are three areas that we think uh, the country needs, so we will uh, go and put that together, again, public and, and, and private uh, collaboration. Uh, we will uh, roll out a livable city design challenge uh, to put in better urban planning and economic planning for cities, and announce that in uh, March, in the next uh, two weeks. Uh, as John already said, APEC 2015, uh, very deeply involved in that, not only logistics, but even in the policy discussion between private sector and the government on what the APEC priorities will be, so we will be ready uh, when we chair APEC in 2015. So everybody always focuses on logistics of preparation, uh, preparations for hosting, but equally important and not as appreciated, I think, is the preparation for policy discussion for APEC in 2015. And this requires uh, Philippine private sector support for the government uh, priorities. And uh, finally, we're trying to figure out and design a project on deregulation, trying to uh, repeal or uh, first a review and a listing and then the repeal of laws which are no longer uh, relevant. I know this is a tedious exercise, but so important because we are really encumbered by a lot of bureaucracy. So I won't go through this, but it's in your packet, and this is what I gave last year, one of my closing slides, the 10 lessons that we have learned uh, so far. Uh, so that's there. Uh, there is an 11th lesson I'd like to put up, which is that private collaboration does work. So please don't get discouraged. Uh, for the next two and a half years, I think it is important to work together, uh, multi-agency and multi-business organization, to try to make the country more competitive. Uh, I think leaving the private sector alone to its own work uh, is effective, but unfortunately you don't have the decision makers to help you make the change. Uh, if you have the government working alone, they don't have the customers to give them the feedback, so we need to work together to be able to, to, to improve. Finally, let me get back to my original questions. Uh, where have we succeeded? Uh, clearly, governance has, has helped. It has improved, uh, not only governance for governance sake, but it's actually improved operations and uh, accountability across many agencies and across many types of, of transactions. And you see the effects uh, felt across many of the global indices that, that track us, World Economic Forum, uh, ease of doing business, Transparency International, Economic Heritage, uh, Economic Freedom Index. Uh, all these track governance and we have improved in that. Where have we fallen behind and quite frankly what's killing us? It's bureaucracy. Okay? Uh, it takes too long to get anything done. Absolutely too long to get absolutely anything done. And I think we need to be mindful that other countries have really made improvements in their bureaucracy. And if we don't make these improvements faster, we will fall behind. It's not a matter of making some improvement because the other guys are making large improvements. We have to make larger improvements. Bureaucracy is, is uh, the one that uh, we're falling behind. 
How do we move forward? We have to have absolute emphasis on on-time execution. Uh, Bobby talked about his project, uh, 10 to 12 years in the making for a decision. Uh, the airport project uh, since 97, uh, just to consider a, a new international terminal. Uh, even the renovation uh, work on uh, terminals one and three, uh, that was a two-year decision, uh, a two-year time frame before a decision in execution uh, late last year or mid last year for Terminal 3 and January this year for Terminal 1. So we cannot be sitting back and taking our time making uh, uh, decisions. On time execution, I think, is the thing that we need to have and the discipline we should have uh, to be able to move the country forward. And finally, uh, how do we build a culture of competitiveness? And uh, this is what we're trying to really think through uh, with, uh, with agencies and with the private sector. And ultimately, I think it's really a state of mind. We have to get into a competitive mode. And under many circumstances, we see people in very competitive modes. What we have to do is be able to translate this into government as an enterprise. And I think if we are to treat uh, an, a government as an enterprise and think of a you know, try to instill that competitive state of mind, as we see in many other instances, whether individually or collectively by uh, smaller organizations, then I think the country will move ahead. But uh, if we don't, uh, if we are not committed to breaking uh, the, the bureaucracy, if we're not committed to on-time execution, and we're not committed to making this uh, uh, culture, building this culture of competitiveness throughout the country, then we will fall behind. But if we uh, put this together, as I think, as I've seen in many instances, and, and there are examples here in, in, in PESA, for instance, with, with uh, Director General de Lima, uh, they are determined to, to perform. And I'd like to see the day when PESA is not the outlier among agencies, but in fact, one of many agencies which perform like PESA. And in that sense, we will all be competitive in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bilus. And now to introduce the guest speaker, moderator, and panelists of our next session, may we call on the president of the European Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, Mr. Michael Roiber. Friends of Arancada, distinguished guests, corporate and business association sponsors, my name is Michael Reuber. I'm the president of the European Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines. Before I introduce our first uh, panel speakers, let me recognize some of our important guests not yet mentioned before, amongst which are the House Chairman of the uh, Committee for Constitutional Amendments, Representative Mylene Garcia Albano, the uh, CAAP Director General Hotchkiss, FDA Director General Kenneth Hartigan Go, and the former Press Secretary Riggi Karandang. Our first uh, panel discussion will deal with three high job uh, generating sectors, agribusiness, manufacturing, and tourism, medical travel, and retirement. May I now invite our speaker, panel moderator, and the panelists to the stage as I will briefly introduce them to you. So may I please ask Mr. Rogier van den Brink, Mr. Coco Alquas, Mr. Philip Sullivan, Mr. Roberto Batung Bacal, and Eileen, Ms. Eileen Clemente to come to the stage.
very well. So let me introduce our personalities here. Dr. Rogier Van den Brink is the lead economist for the World Bank in the Philippines. Before the Philippines, Dr. Van den Brink worked in Mongolia, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Burkina Faso, and Washington. The World Bank Philippines published last year a highly significant report entitled Creating More and Better Jobs with policy recommendations that should be supported by government, labor, and business sectors. As business head of the ABS-CBN news channel, our panel moderator, Mr. Coco Alquas, is a familiar person for his popular daytime and evening shows. Previously, Coco was Manila bureau chief of Bloomberg News. He has generously donated his services to moderate our annual forum for the last three years. Thank you, Coco. Our agribusiness expert today is Mr. Philip Sullivan. President of Cargill, Philippines, and Chairman of the Agribusiness Roundtable held in December 2009 that produced recommendations for Arancada. Philip is also active in the Agribusiness Working Group of the National Competitiveness Council. Cargill employs over 140,000 people in 67 countries. Our manufacturing export expert uh, Roberto, Mr. Roberto Batung Bacal is a leader in the manufacturing industry resurgence in the country, chairman of AMCHAM's Manufacturing Committee and president of the Chemical Industry Association of the Philippines. He is country, Philippine country manager of Dow Chemical Company, the second largest chemical firm in the world with about 53,000 employees. And our Tourism expert is Mrs. Eileen Clemente, Vice President of the Tourism Congress of the Philippines and Chairman and President of Raja Travel Corporation. Eileen has graced our panels before and has, a very, act and has very actively participated in our Arancada roundtables. So thank you again. The assessment documentary that everyone here should be browsing through contains sections in part three on each of the three sectors this panel will discuss. It also has sections in part four on business costs and labor that are relevant. Agribusiness, manufacturing, and tourism are sectors that currently employ millions of Filipinos. However, their potential to create much greater employment and much better jobs is far from being realized and is being restrained by underinvestment. A third of the population is in the agricultural sector where productivity is low and poverty, poverty serious. Manufacturing only contributes 21% of GDP in 2012. We have given you a copy of our manufacturing policy brief that calls for raising this percentage to 29% by 2022 and creating 4 million new jobs. Domestic and international tourism are growing strongly, primarily limited, however, not by any lack of international promotion or addition of accommodations, but by the slowness of developing airport infrastructure. Please also see part three, infrastructure airports. With this very brief introduction for this panel, I will now ask Dr. Van den Brink to give his remarks to be followed by the panel discussion and the brief open forum. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Please answer me one question. The dress code in the Philippines, it's a mystery to me. Whenever I wear a barong, people are in suits, and when people are in suits, when people are in barongs, I have a suit on, so. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm giving a speech uh, on behalf of a threesome. Moto Konishi, the country director, couldn't be here with us today. Carl Chua, who I'm very proud to mentor. He's the author of the report that was just mentioned, the report on jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak to you at the third anniversary of Arancada. I would like to structure my presentation along five core messages. 
First, the central policy challenge facing the Philippines today is how to accelerate inclusive growth, the type that creates more and better jobs and reduces poverty. Let me make it clear from the outset what we mean by that. By jobs, we mean what people do to make a living. So it includes formal work and informal work. It covers wage workers and self-employment. It covers businesses of all sizes. By good jobs, we mean jobs which raise people's real income and bring them out of poverty. Second message, you already know what reforms are needed to create more and better jobs. Previous speakers have mentioned them. The Arancada project has put a long list together. And like I just mentioned, we produced a development report on jobs. Third, the reasons why these reforms are well known but not implemented are also well known. Reforms create winners and losers. And for decades, no centuries, the winners have been unable to convince the losers that implementing these reforms would put the country on a much higher growth path than before, which would also benefit those who would lose out in the short term. Hence, there's no simple and quick technical solution for the reform agenda. It will require a political process and agreement. Fourth, a unique window of opportunity exists today to accelerate reforms that will help create more and better jobs. And finally, and more importantly, seizing this window of opportunity is not just the job of the president. It's the job of government, business, labor, and civil society. They need to work together with a heightened sense of urgency and agree on an action plan for job creation. Reforms need a crisis, and I will suggest to you a crisis. The crisis is that we have 856 days left. What is the jobs challenge? Soon we will have the full 2013 data, but for now let's start at the end of 2012. In the report on jobs we released last year, we calculated that we needed 14.6 million more and better jobs for the 3 million unemployed Filipinos, 7 million underemployed Filipinos, and the several million new entrants in the labor force every year until 2016. What can the economy, as it is currently structured, provide? Let us assume that the current high growth rate in, say, business process outsourcing is maintained. Growth in manufacturing is doubled. We estimate that of the half a million college graduates every year, only 240,000 would be absorbed in the formal sector. And every year, about 200,000 college graduates simply leave the country and find the better jobs abroad. The remaining 650,000 entrants, of which around half have high school degrees, would have no other option but to find or create work in the low skill and low pay informal sector. It is this type of job which creates the bigger problem of underemployment, because if you are poor, you cannot afford to be unemployed. In all, the formal sector would be able to provide good jobs to around 2.2 million people in the next four years, or around double the current figure but we needed 14.6 million jobs. So that leaves us with a deficit of 12.4 million jobs for those who would be unemployed, underemployed, or informally employed. This is the crisis we need to address with 856 days left. With growth accelerating to historic highs, why is the economy still having difficulty in creating more and better jobs? This is because the country's long history of policy distortion has slowed the growth of agriculture and manufacturing in the last six decades. Instead of a thriving agricultural sector paving the way for the development of a vibrant labor-intensive manufacturing sector and subsequently a high-skill services sector, the converse has taken place in the Philippines. The agriculture sector has remained depressed. Manufacturing has failed to grow sustainably and a low productivity, low skill services sector has emerged as the dominant sector of the economy. This is what your scholars, such as NEDA Secretary R.C. Balisakan, mean when they speak about the Philippines' lack of structural transformation. And Secretary Balisakan is in eminent international committee, in, 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 is in eminent international company. In 1974, 
Gustav Ranis, professor at Yale University, at the invitation of President Marcus, led a high-level high level mission to assess the Philippine economy. He concluded that there was no basis for sustained growth because the economy was not backed by a strong agricultural sector, and given this, there was also no basis for sustained industrial growth. Moreover, manufacturing was inward-looking, not focused on export markets. Two decades later, another high-level mission, led by Paul Krugman, arrived at the same assessment. Krugman concluded, the most crucial failure of Philippine development strategy lies in its employment record. He called for more support to agriculture and land reform, and for far more competition in the economy. The key breaks on a successful structural transformation are the following. The lack of competition in key sectors, the inward-looking orientation of the economy, the lack of access to secure property rights for the majority of the population, the purposefully complex and untransparent maze of government regulations, and severe underinvestment by the public sector in health, education, and infrastructure. This analysis is nothing new. And the outcomes of the long history of policy distortions are nothing new either. Poverty reduction is very slow, informality is pervasive, and many of the country's best and brightest migrate overseas in search of better jobs. Even the reforms necessary to remove the distortions and breaks are nothing new. Many of them are contained in the Arancada agenda. So why do we think that this time is different? Why do we think that these reforms can now be implemented after they have stalled for so long? First, the wind is in your sails. The country is benefiting from strong macroeconomic fundamentals, political stability, and a popular government that many see as truly committed to improving the lives of the people. Second, the country stands to benefit from the global and regional economic rebalancing and the strong growth prospects of a dynamic East Asia region. China's real wages are zooming up. The Philippines can be very much part of a dynamic factory Asia where parts of the production value chains are looking for new places to relocate to. Third, the Aquino government has demonstrated that it is not afraid to tackle vested interests in areas which had previously been too sensitive to reform. Several reforms are underway, notably in transparency, public financial management, tax policy and administration, anti-corruption and social service delivery. Fourth, and here's the crisis we need to create. Many stakeholders like what they see, but they're also afraid it could all come un undone in 856 days when the president leaves on June 30, 2016. The current window of opportunity marks a critical juncture in the country's history, a moment not to miss. So rather than gazing in the political crystal ball, it would make sense to work together with a sense of urgency, seize the moment, and make sure the country's taking the right direction at this critical juncture. We all need to come to the table now and form coalitions for reform with a heightened sense of urgency. 856 days left. Why coalitions and what would be their basis? By now the Aquino administration's success in generating confidence and economic growth is providing strong incentives to an ever broader group of stakeholders to see such growth continue beyond this administration and ensure that the pursuit of inclusive growth is sustained. Strategically forging such reform coalitions around certain teams, themes or geographic areas should be a high priority for all who wish to see the country continue to do better. That has to be the basis for a broad